Okay. So, so yes, I'm going to record with Evan's permission this program. Um, greatly generated, you know, so generous of him to allow us to do so tonight. And hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm so glad all of you are here tonight. It's um, so wonderful that we have Evan Weiner. Evan Weiner has spoken with us before, but in the library. And uh, so now he's on Zoom, and hopefully we'll have him again in person, you know, in the near future. But right now, I'm so glad he's with us on Zoom. His topic is the year 1972. It might sound like a random year, but we are here to celebrate the Friends of the Library. Our great friends of the library have been with us now for seven, for 50 years. And um, so for 50 years, they have been committed and dedicated. They have served with their time and their effort and their love of the library, um, their, their love for the Westfield community um, to, to serve this library for um, you know, all these years. And it's such, been such a pleasure to, to work with them as they, um, you know, were creative during the pandemic, helping us with some programming, uh, outdoor programs. And um, I can't thank them enough. Uh, our co-presidents this year are Marcy Lechner and Mike Miller. Um, but, you know, I know years and years of presidents and they're all in my heart, they're all in my mind. Um, all of the friends who have worked in book sales, uh, fundraising attempts, so many um, efforts and commitments when you see furniture, when you see sometimes, you know, different computers, when you see the mural in the children's department, when you see programs like this and the uh, programs for the children's department, our Black History Month programs, all of that sponsored by the Friends of the Library. And, um, you know, I think of their work as a labor of love, because um, you certainly don't put in so much time, commitment, and hauling of books back and forth from a book sale. Um, when it's not for a lot of passion for what you're doing. So I'm gonna have a big shout out to them. Thank you friends, thank you for, you know, uh, continuing 50 years of love and service for us. And um, so everybody give a, maybe even a virtual round of applause for them. Thank you, thank you. And um, so without further ado, uh, Evan, you're, the, you're uh, the star of the show tonight. Thank you for being our, our, um, our speaker and I'll have you take it away. Thank you so much and everybody enjoy. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me and thanks to the friends. Uh, 50 years seems like a long time. It seems like a distant time uh, that uh, has no relationship to uh, what's going on in 2022, but it has a lot of relationship uh, between 1972 and 2022. And uh, that's me. I'm at the age of 15 there in March of uh, 1972. I went to high school at Spring Valley High School in Rockland County in New York, north of uh, the Jersey border that goes that way at that point. And um, the New York Giants, uh, some of the New York Giants uh, playing a basketball game against uh, the Spring Valley teachers. And uh, I was already a professional radio person by the time I was 15. And uh, here I am talking to Bob Highland, who if you're an old Giant fan, you might remember him. And he ended up trying to become the White Plains mayor, but lost in an election. But 1972, well, that guy, uh, Dick Nixon, please call me Dick. I'll have some Nixon stories here in a few minutes. He meets with Mao Zedong. And uh, 50 years ago, the United States and China began a relationship. And uh, it may be rocky today. It was certainly rocky when uh, Nixon went to Peking. That is Patsy Mink. Patsy Mink was a congresswoman from Hawaii. Um, she uh, was from Maui, and uh, some of you in the audience who are of a certain age might remember prior to 1972, women did not have the same uh, educational opportunities in higher education, colleges and university. And uh, Patsy Mink uh, with Edith Green and uh, Ted Stevens and Birch Bayh and uh, again, uh, Richard Nixon uh, changed that for hundreds of millions of uh, American women over the last 50 years. Uh, these are the plumbers, uh, James McCourt, Virgilio Gonzalez, Frank Sturgis, Eugenio Martinez, and 
Bernard Baker, they were the ones who broke into the Watergate Hotel in Washington, and there is the Watergate. Jane Fonda sat on a tank in Hanoi, North Vietnam, and told American bombers, stop bombing, you know, just stop bombing uh, North Vietnam, particularly civilian areas. And uh, that's the soldier. The soldier was still in Vietnam in 1972. And those are demonstrators. There were demonstrations still going on in 1972. And um, some of the Vietnamese with bombings taking place. George Wallace was assassinated in Maryland in 1972. And terror, uh, terrorism came into your living room on ABC with Jim McKay narrating uh, the wide world of sports announcer who was the Olympics anchor, uh, the 1972 Munich Olympics, the Black September uh, terrorist attack. And in Northern Ireland, the troubles continue. And the man in blue was actually a woman in blue, at least in Geneva, New York, on uh, June 24th, 1972. But uh, let's get to Red China or Communist China and a uh, shout out to Stewie Gates, my ninth grade social studies teacher back at Spring Valley Junior High School, 6970, who never let us forget that Red China and Communist China were the names of the country, which was really the People's Republic of China, but it was Red China and it was um, uh, Communist China. And there is Nixon and there is Mao. Beginning in 1949, the relationship between the People's Republic of China and the United States uh, had been clouded by Cold War propaganda, trade embargoes, diplomatic silence. In fact, no official American delegation set foot in the People's Republic of China at that point in more than 22 years. But there was an opening. Richard Nixon is running for president in 1968. And he is making one of his campaign pledges how we should open up relationship or relationship with Red China. See, by that point, um, the Soviets and the Chinese weren't getting along. In fact, uh, they were fighting uh, over uh, who had the purest form of communism, whether it was Red China or whether it was the Soviet Union. And that fight splits open in 1958 by 1969. Uh, there were blo uh, bloody border clashes between the two countries. In fact, uh, Brezhnev, Leonid Brezhnev, the leader of the Soviet Union, toyed with dropping a nuclear bomb on uh, Red China in 1969. And there is Mao. Uh, Mao believed that uh, ties with America and the Americans might serve as a deterrent against uh, the Russians or the Soviets. See, nothing ever changes, does it? Uh, the U.S. president, Nixon, of course, elected in 1968, wanted to go to China. He absolutely wanted to go to China, uh, and that was a top priority of his administration. Yeah, right. Oh, oh right over there. Yeah, that, that's China on the map. Uh, the opening crack. During the 1971 World Table Tennis Championships, in Nagoya, Japan, there was a 19-year-old player who didn't live too far from where I am right now. In fact, he uh, basically honed his skills as a ping-pong player over at the beach clubs uh, in New Rochelle, and my wife knew him uh, as a kid. His name, Glenn Cowan. He's 19 years old, and she said he had custom-made uh, uh, table tennis uh, paddles when he was a kid over at uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, beach clubs over in New Rochelle on Long Island Sound. Anyway, he hops on the team bus carrying the Chinese national team. This is in 1971. There he is. And uh, Chuang Zhang is uh, the greatest player in China. And he steps forward and shakes Cowan's hand. And he speaks to him through an interpreter. Now, why is there an interpreter there? In fact, why are there photographers there? It's just a team bus. Somebody tipped off somebody. Nobody knows the real story. It's never come out. Although I have a friend um, who was who is a Paralympian, was a Paralympian in table tennis. He said, from what he heard over the years, his name is Kent Anderson, um, that it was a setup. That everybody knew what was going on. The Chinese players arrived at the 1971 championships in Japan with strict orders: avoid all contact with the Americans. But uh, Chairman Mao, upon learning of this gift exchange, sees it as an opportunity. Zhang Zong is not just a good table tennis player. 
he's a good diplomat as well. And uh, here's Joe in line, and that's Henry Kissinger, special advisor to Nixon, and their meeting in 1971, because Nixon secretly sends Henry Kissinger to Peking to arrange a presidential visit to China. And Nixon's journey to China would take place in February of 1972. Now, these guys back in 1971, China, a whole new game. And there's Cowan sitting. He's on the bottom there with uh, the white sneakers leaning back on the left side with the long hair. Um, these guys basically were nickel and dime tennis players, uh, table tennis players, rather. Um, they had to beg, borrow, and steal to get money to go over to Japan. And all of a sudden, they're the world's foremost diplomats in 1971. First color photos, Yangtze Peking, Time Magazine. Never before in history has a sport been used so effectively as a tool of international diplomacy, said the Chinese premier, Cho Enlai. For Nixon, it, well, it, it was the week that, that changed the world. And there they are, Mao Zedong and Richard Nixon. Nixon noted that the Chinese leaders took particular delight in reminding me that an exchange of ping pong teams had initiated a breakthrough in our relations. They seemed to enjoy the method used to achieve the result almost as much as the result itself. But there's a problem. Of course, there's always a problem. The problem was in 1949, there was a civil war in China. It was the forces uh, behind Mao Zedong, and it was the forces behind Chiang Kai-shek and the Song sisters. Um, and uh, basically, uh, Mao Zedong side won. And that forced Chiang Kai-shek to go into exile uh, into Taiwan. And today, 50 years after Nixon goes to China, Taiwan is still a, a potential hotspot in the world because China wants to reclaim it. The Taiwan problem. The United States in 1972 still recognized the defeated Nationalist Party as the legitimate government of China, despite the fact that the Nationalists had retreated to Taiwan and no longer controlled any territory on the Chinese mainland. And here they are. Here's the meetings. Uh, there is Nixon and there is Chairman Mao. Nixon's visit to China started the process of normalizing relations between the PRC and the United States, it also pushed Washington to distance itself from Taiwan. And that problem still remains 50 years later. The Shanghai communique, Nixon met with uh, Mao Zedong, Communist Party of China on February 21st. The two leaders had a serious and frank exchange of views on Sinai-US relations and world affairs. Nixon and Cho Enlai worked on the normalization of relations between the two countries. Oh, but it's time to eat. It's time to eat. Look at Nixon. He's watching Cho Enlai, watching him use those chopsticks. Nixon has chopsticks in his hands, and white chopsticks. And maybe Cho Enlai is saying, oh, oh, a dick, uh, this is the way you use him. Oh, I wonder how that tastes. He looks like he's at a restaurant, doesn't he? It's like, waiter, can you get me what they have? Look at him. Look at them. Nixon and his party visit Peking, viewed cultural, industrial, and architect architectural, architecture, agricultural sites. And they toured Hengchang and Shanghai. And they kept talking with the Chinese leaders. And yeah, they, went, they were accidental tourists, right? Look at this. Look at this. He's in front of the troops. He's inspecting the troops. What gets me about that picture is that uh, there's Dick Nixon, and there's Pat, um, the long-suffering Pat Nixon. Uh, and, and I'll get into the story about how I met Richard Nixon in a little bit and dealt with him. There's Pat Nixon. She's way behind. He's having the time of his life. Pat, look at that. Pat, Pat. The outcome, the leaders of the People's Republic of China and the United States found it beneficial to have this opportunity after so many years without contact to present candidly to one another their views on various issues. Now, while that is going on, and while Nixon is leaving Pat behind in China, although they came home together, uh, something else is going on. There's women's liberation. And um, there is something afoot 
Capitol Hill in Washington with women in education. But before I get there, if you ever go out to San Francisco, there's the Musique Magnifique Museum out on the wharf. And if you love old pinball games and all that kind of stuff from Nickelodeons to old pinball games at work, go over to Pier 39, San Francisco. And this picture is from November 2019, the last time I was in San Francisco. This is the pre-1960s thinking. To be happy, see what every married woman must not avoid, which basically said do everything that your husband tells you to do or else. Title IX. Patsy T. Mink, Equal Opportunity and Education Act, the Education Amendment of 1972 or Title IX. 1971, Congresswoman Patsy Mink of Hawaii and Edith Green of Oregon were given the chance to help other women pursue their dreams without gender discrimination, and they took it. June 23rd, 1972. Title IX of the Education Amendments is enacted by Congress and signed into law by Dick Nixon. The sponsors of Title IX, Indiana Democrat, Birch by in the Senate, uh, and the Oregon Congresswoman Edith Green. Uh, Title IX prohibits sex discrimination in any education program or activity receiving any type of federal financial aid. And there is Patsy T. Mink. Uh, she had the ability. She was quite uh, a woman in terms of being able to do a lot of things. Patsy T. Mink was elected the first female president of the student body at Maui High School, territory of Hawaii, and she was a valedictorian of her graduating class in 1944. She had a political career, law school, then back to Hawaii. She was politically ambitious. 1958, she was elected to the territory of Hawaii Senate. A year later, the bicameral territory legislature was dissolved because Hawaii would become a state. And uh, she sought uh, to become a congresswoman from Hawaii uh, and sought the Democratic nomination, but was uh, beaten out by Daniel Inouye. Uh, she rises up the political ladder in 1962. She runs for election to Hawaiian Senate uh, and was successful. Two years later, she's victorious in her race for a seat in Congress. Um, she was an early supporter of a successful effort to allow female members of Congress to use the heretofore all men, all male house gym. They wouldn't let her in. Look at the gym. They got the Indian clubs and all that, and the rowing machine. They wouldn't let her use it. They wouldn't let her use it. And she was a Congresswoman. She was a champion of women's rights, but she didn't want to be characterized as a feminist. In the late 1960s, she became increasingly outspoken, an opponent of the ongoing Vietnam War. In Congress, she worked tirelessly on behalf of legislation in the fields of civil rights, including those of women and children, as well as health care, welfare, and education. Uh, sports and education uh, rejection uh, led her to Title IX. Uh, after her college years at the University of Hawaii, she was a good student, remember, valedictorian and an athlete, Maui High School. Uh, she applied to medical school, and uh, she received 12 rejections due to what she believed was gender discrimination. So, can't go to med medical school, so let's go to law school. She goes to law school, but she continues to face sexism. She's denied a job at a law firm because she was a married woman. Well, by the way, she married a mainlander, and that causes a lot of problems. Uh, she tries to start her own practice, but government officials only allowed residents of Hawaii to take the bar exam, even though she was born in Hawaii, even though she was the valedictorian at Maui High School, even though she went to the University of Hawaii. Well, she marries a mainlander, and she becomes a non-resident of Hawaii. She becomes the resident of whatever area that uh, her husband was from. He happened to be from Chicago. So she's a non-resident. She can't take the law school test. She had to fight for her right to take the bar exam. She won, passed the exam, became the first Japanese-American woman lawyer in Hawaiian history. She served in Congress 65 to 77 and 1990 to 2002. That is Patsy Mink on the left, that is Edith Green on the right. In 1954, Edith Green was elected as a representative for Oregon's third congressional district. 
She focused on women's issues, education, social reform. In 1955, she proposed the Equal Pay Act to ensure that men and women were paid equally for equal work. She got the bill through Congress, gets to John Kennedy's desk in 1963, June of 1963. He signs the bill, but the bill is never enforced. Edith Green, Democrat from Congress, mother of higher education, the Library Services Act provided access to libraries for rural communities. The Higher Education Facilities Act of 63, Higher Education Act of 65, 67, that was her. Her commitment to education got her the nickname the mother of higher education or Mrs. Education. I went to uh, junior high school in the late 1960s, Spring Valley High School, uh, up in Rockland County, Spring Valley, New York, off of Route 45. And um, there were programs for people like me, guys like me after school, but there were none in Spring Valley. Well, I shouldn't say none. There was cheerleading and future teachers of America uh, in the 1960s. And Green pointed out there were programs to keep boys in school after school, but no similar programs existed for girls. She sought to uh, correct this inequity. Um, and she introduced a higher education bill that contained provisions regarding gender equality or equity in education. Title IX, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. Now, believe it or not, there's a problem because uh, Title IX was highly controversial. A lot of people supported the law, but there were others. There were others around who said, uh, we do this. It's going to be too dangerous. We're going to force schools to accept women? That's going to ruin American education. At least some people felt that way. Donna Deverona. Don the Devereux, I didn't put it in this. I should have. I, I have. I, it just happened the other day. It's a picture of Donna Deverona the other day uh, at the unveiling of the uh, 50th anniversary of the Title IX stamp, uh, the 50th anniversary, which she said, hey, look at this. And I said, yeah, cool. Anyway, Donna Deverona was talking about, uh, let me give you a background on Donna. She won two gold medals at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Uh, very smart woman, very, very smart woman, uh, and we've been friends for over 30 years. Um, and um, she wins the two gold medals, Tokyo Olympics and swimming. Very smart, wants to go to Stanford University, and she has the grades and all, but she wants an athletic scholarship. She says, well, you know, got the, the two gold medals, did it in Tokyo, got the marks. What do you think? No, no. You're a girl. We're not giving you a scholarship. Well, uh, the ally, as Donna said, Ted Stevens, Uncle Ted, Ted Stevens, the Republican senator from Alaska. Um, and there is Donna with her two gold medals from 1964. And she said, sent me a quote, without Senator Stevens' co-sponsor, I doubt Title IX would have survived. It's a time when we needed a strong Republican. He championed the rights of athletes and protected Title IX, as well as always being there when there was a challenge to the law. Why Title IX? Why Ted Stevens? Well, he was an avid tennis player. He saw value in sports and recreation uh, reflected in his personal and professional lives. Uh, and his daughters couldn't play Little League Baseball. Title IX provided women's equality in sports, which is probably the downfall of Title IX, as Donna, and there's Donna, and there's Ted Stevens, and there's my buddy Harvey Schiller, who will come back in the... Uh, talk. He was the uh, commissioner of the Southeast Conference, push for women's sports. Um, and uh, Donna, of course, is there and Ted Stevens. Um, Birch Bay, Democratic senator from Indiana. Now, I'm going to reference Stewie Gates again because unwittingly, Stewie Gates left a big impression on me in 1969 and 70. I was just 13 years old in 1969. I was a year ahead. I got thrown out of kindergarten. They had nowhere to put, put me after nine days, so they put me in the first grade. Imagine me being thrown out of kindergarten because I talked too much. Well, that was the problem, among other things. So they put me in first grade. 
So I'm 13. Everybody else is 14 in the class. And Stewie is giving us a talk because, and by the way, Stewie is still alive. He's up in Stony Point where he stepped down about a decade ago in his mid eighties fighting fires, volunteer firemen. Anyway, so Stewie gets us around one day and um, I don't recall if it was in 69 or 70, it was in that calendar year. And he starts talking to us and, and starts giving us advice. He said, you know, you're gonna leave Spring Valley Junior High School in June, you're gonna graduate ninth grade and you're gonna go up to 10th grade, uh, new building and you're gonna take the PSATs. And then two years from now, you're going to take the SATs and see how you score on that. And three years from now, you're going to go look to see what college you want to go to. And by the way, for you girls in the class, uh, some of you are going to be going to college to major in three letters, MRS. Hmm. It's always stuck with me stuck with me now for 53 or so years and it's good for the talk because if you listen to birch by you would think he was stewie gates the misunderstanding in his remarks on the senate floor birch by stated we're all familiar with the stereotype that women are pretty things who go to college to find a husband and who go on to graduate school because they want to marry a more interesting husband and finally marry have children and never work again I've heard stories over the years giving this in the Title IX talk about that, and you're taking the place of a man. Why are you here? The desire of many schools not to waste a man's place on a woman stems from such stereotype notions. But the fact, facts absolutely contradict these myths about the weaker sex. Yeah, here's a question for you. If women are weaker, how come they outlive men? Myron Cohn, because they want to. And it's time to change our operating assumptions. While the impact of this amendment would be far reaching, it's not a panacea. It is, however, an important step in the effort to provide for the women of America something that is rightfully theirs, an equal chance to attend the schools of their choice, to develop the skills they want and apply those skills with the knowledge, they will have a fair chance to secure the jobs of their choice with equal pay for equal work. Now, you gotta remember why this was a shock to the system of some of the men who thought it was dangerous. Now, this is from the Henry Ford Museum of all places when I was there five years ago. Uh, of all places, Henry Ford, it, it's like a civil rights museum in some ways, which is odd considering Henry Ford. But anyway, women's rights. In the 1800, 1800s, 19th century, American women had fewer rights than a male inmate in an insane asylum. Think of that. Women could not vote, serve on a jury, testify in court, hold public office, attend college, or practice law. If a woman were married, it was illegal for her to sign a contract, own or inherit property, keep or invest her own earnings, have automatic rights to her children. Women were expected to center their lives around family and home, Obey their husbands in all manners, not voice strong opinions in public, behave in a refined, polite way. Title IX was enacted as a follow up to the passage of the Civil Rights Act, July 7th, 1964. The Civil Rights Act was passed to end discrimination in various fields based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in areas of employment and public accommodation. Uh, the 1964 Act, which was the first of actually four civil rights acts, uh, the Civil the Voting uh, Vote, the Voting Rights Act of 65, this one, and the Equal Rights Amendment 1972, which I'll get into in a couple minutes. Uh, the 64 Act did not prohibit sex discrimination against persons employed at educational institutions. Women students were denied equal opportunities under the law and academics. Women applicants were routinely denied equal access to medical, law, and other graduate schools. And women athletes denied equal participation in sports. When I do my Title IX talk, I give tons of examples that I've heard from women of a certain age about discrimination, which I can't get into today because we're, we got a finite uh, amount of time here and there are lots, a lot of more stories to go. 
1972, pre-1972, similarly, female faculty members were denied equal compensation and promotion. Today's rise of uh, women uh, in uh, all academic disciplines uh, and in sports at every level is in many ways a direct outgrowth of the landmark Title IX legislation. Oh, yeah, oh, I, 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 I signed the bill. He did. Now he gives the salute after that, defiant. Congress passed the final version of the bill in June 1972, and Nixon signs it into law June 23rd. There have been many times in the last 50 years where it has been challenged. Title IX has gone back to Congress many more times than most laws. 24 times by 2007, the last time Rod Brooks, the educational secretary under George W. Bush, uh, actually uh, canvassed uh, college students saying, do we still need this? And you know what the answer that came back. Uh, Title IX. Uh, Donna sent this to me. Uh, I have the actual picture now, but she sent this to me a couple of weeks ago. And she said, you coming? I said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to be where you are. Day, first day of issue stamp dedication ceremony, Thursday, uh, March 3rd, 2022, 11 a.m. Uh, uh, first day of issue uh, ceremony uh, agenda, Title IX. Uh, strangely, that, well, Nixon was a strange guy, and I'll just leave it at that because I got to know him for about three years, 85 to 88, strange guy. Anyway, Nixon signed the bill, and he speaks mostly about desegregation and busing. He doesn't mention the expansion of uh, educational access for women that he just signed into law. You know, he changes the lives of now hundreds of millions of American women. Uh, he didn't change her life, though. That's Bernice Guerra. Bernice Guerra was a Queens housewife, dissatisfied with her lot in life in the mid-1960s, just being a housewife. She just didn't want to spend all of her time going to Bohack. If you lived on Long Island, you know what Bohack was. It was a supermarket, Bohack, B-O-H-A-C-K. Uh, I spent part of my life in Queens. Anyway, she was a Queens housewife, bored of it. She's talking to her husband one day. She said, Gotta be more to life than being a housewife. Well, what do you like? I don't know. Baseball. Hey, be a baseball umpire. In 1969, Bernice Guerra received a contract from the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues to work in the Class A short season New York Penn League. But Guerra received a telegram from the then NAPBL president, Philip Python, informing her the contract's been disapproved and it's invalid. Now, baseball executive Ed Doherty said this was the problem. Can't have any women. But even if you wanted to have women, they have to be 21 through 35 years old, a minimum of 5 feet, 10 inches tall, and weigh at least 170 pounds. Poor uh, Bernice, she's 38 years old. She's only 5 foot 2. She weighs 126 pounds. And, yeah, okay, she, she does have some experience for the National Baseball Congress, in Bridgetown, New Jersey, and uh, in the uh, recreation programs in the slums, but we don't want her. We don't want her, but she wants them. A woman is qualified. Three years, took three years. New York State Division of Rights versus New York, Pennsylvania, Professional Baseball League. Court rules in 1972 that being a man is not a bona fide occupational qualification for umpires. On June 24th, 1972, Bernice Guerra, after three years of court battles, gets onto a minor league baseball field in Geneva, New York, where she umpired a Class A minor league game between the Geneva Rangers, Texas Rangers farm team, and the Auburn Phillies, Philadelphia Phillies farm team, and the now defunct New York Penn League. Uh, baseball, Major League Baseball owners put them out of business after uh, the 2019 season, 2020 COVID season. Uh, and she gets to run into uh, Nolan Campbell. But before I, before I even get into that, she goes to the hotel prior to the game. Now, this is not the Ritz. This is uh, Motel, yeah, Motel 8, Super, or Super 8, Motel 6. They keep the lights on anyway. Uh, these are kind of hotels. And she's in Geneva, New York, and she's met with protesters. There are protesters. And think of this. There are protesters going in front of this hotel chanting at her. Didn't they have anything better to do, these eight men? 
They cursed Gara. They shattered the lights outside the motel room before the game. She stays into her in her room, studying baseball plays, professional rules. She doesn't eat. Her stomach churns at the mention of food. She's going to umpire a double header that night, except she doesn't. No, there she is, the woman in blue, and there is Nolan Campbell. She worked her first and only minor league game, exhausted by a legal battle. It says five years, but it's three years. To secure a minor league job, she resigned immediately after the game. Peeling potatoes. Guerra was berated by the Auburn manager, Nolan Campbell, for reversing a double play call. She resigned between games of the doubleheader, citing the lack of cooperation from her fellow umpires. There was one. Get into that in a second. Campbell told her she should be in the kitchen peeling potatoes. I got them thrown out. But the other umpire, who wasn't cooperating with Bernice Guerra, went over to calm down Nolan Campbell, put his arm around him, and they walked, walked arm in arm back to the dugout. Um, Steve Guerra said, Bernice would always say I could beat them in the courts, but I can't beat them on the field. Uh, she had had it. She was worn out. The woman in blue. After the final out, she left the field never to return as a professional umpire. When I got in the car, I broke down. She resigned because of lack of cooperation from her fellow umpires. And she was criticized by women's groups, saying that she should have hung in there. She didn't want to. The Equal Rights Amendment, and there is Bella Abzug. And my connection with Bella Abzug is through my aunt, Pearl Berkowitz, who was her chief of staff. Bella Abzug, my aunt, was her chief of staff. It passes the Equal Rights Amendment, which provided the legal equality of the sexes, was passed by the U.S. Senate on March 22nd and sent to the states for ratification. New Jersey's own Alice Paul had written the original Equal Rights Amendment about 50 years earlier. Alice Paul was one of those suffragettes who was ready to die to get the vote. In fact, she tried to starve herself, and uh, she was taken away by people, thrown into an insane asylum um, because they thought she was crazy. Uh, in 1923, in Seneca Falls, New York, for the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the 1848 Women's Rights Convention, Alice Paul first introduced the first version or the uh, version of the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. It was called the Lucretia Mott Amendment at the time. She would update the doctrine in 1943. Equal Rights Amendment. Stop Equal Rights Amendment. Phyllis Schlafly. That's the woman with the bullhorn. Men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subjected to its jurisdiction. The amendment was introduced in Congress the same year. It was never ratified within the seven-year time period that Congress said you have to have it done by 1970, <coughs> 1979. It needed approval by legislatures in three-fourths or 38 of the 50 states. But in 2020, Virginia became the third state to say yes. Five states withdrew their support. The U.S. archivist has to verify the ratifications, and that's a problem. Problem. Three prominent Republicans didn't want it to happen uh, because Republicans, at least some of them, want to roll back women's rights in 2022. Creep. Richard Nixon. <coughs> Richard Nixon. There would be no other president who would name his reelection campaign, uh, basically committee for the re-election of the president. Creep. The Vietnam War continued. American economy was in the mess, in a mess. It's a 1972 election. In the 1970 midterms, Democrats won the popular vote in the House races by 8%, 8.7%, and they added a dozen seats. In 1971, Nixon's approval ratings dipped below 50%. Oh, uh, please call me Dick. I met Dick Nixon in 1985. It was 85, right? I think it was 80. It was either 84. Or 80. It must have been 85. Uh, because uh, the baseball umpires uh, were at an impasse with the baseball owners in terms of getting a new collective bargaining agreement. And Richie Phillips is the head of the World Umpires Association. 
and P.D. Uberoth is negotiating on behalf of the baseball owners. And um, Richie, who lived in Philadelphia, lived um, off the main line in Society Hill, right, Society Hill. Uh, anyway, uh, he says to Uberoth, uh, well, how about arbitration? Who do you got in mind? How about Dick Nixon? Dick Nixon? No way. Dick Nixon. Now, I knew Richie Phillips. I knew Peter Uberoth. And I was going to get to know Richard Nixon because he was the arbitrator. Uh, and he gave the umpires a big, big race. So I'm 16 years old when Watergate's broken into. There's Richard Nixon's autograph. And that's a basketball that was given to me as a gift, Christmas gift, from the National Basketball Association in 1982. And if you notice the uh, the signature on the ball, it's Lawrence O'Brien. Lawrence O'Brien, who was part of the Kennedy Irish Mafia, who I got to know as the commissioner of the National Basketball Association. What are the odds that a 16-year-old kid going to Spring Valley High School in 1972 is going to interact with Nixon and O'Brien, the two guys at the center of Watergate. And I said to O'Brien one day, I said, why you? He said, they thought I had something valuable. That's G. Gordon Liddy, who goes on to a distinguished career in radio and TV after going to jail, because my business rewards people like that. G. Gordon Liddy. Uh, January 72, G, G. Gordon Liddy, the general counsel to the committee for the re-election of the president, creep, proposes burglarizing and wiretapping the Democratic National Committee's headquarters at the Watergate Complex in Washington, D.C. Why not? Why not break in? And there is Larry O'Brien. Had some interesting stories uh, about uh, Lyndon Johnson. He was Johnson's liaison to Congress for a while. Uh, May 17th, wiretaps placed on the telephones of the Democratic National Committee Chairman, Lawrence O'Brien, and the Executive Director of Democrat States Chairman, R. Spencer Oliver Jr. On June 17th, Frank Wills, a security guard at the Watergate Complex, calls police at 1.30 a.m. Five men are arrested inside the Democratic National Committee's headquarters office. The names are released on June 18th. Virgilio Gonzalez, Bernard Baker, James W. McCourt Jr., Eugenio Martinez, Frank Sturgis, all charged with attempted burglary and attempted interception of telephone and other communications. And there are two reporters there. The guy I like is Carl Bernstein, because he was a street guy. Um, you know, he, he had no formal education on how to do stuff. He learned everything on the streets. The other guy, well, he's the college educated. Well, let me think about this. Whereas Bernstein says, you throw the hand grenade, you throw the bomb, and you ask questions later. I don't know. Let me measure that. It's yin and yang over there. June 19th, Washington Post reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward revealed that one of the Watergate burglars, James McCourt, was a Republican Party security aide. And there is McCourt. June and July, Woodward and Bernstein sourced deep throat Mark Felt, who came out years and years and years later. And Nora Ephron, in her book about being married to Carl Bernstein, said she never knew who deep throat was while she was married to him, reveals uh, the uh, examination. Of the burglar's accounts show the link to the 1972 committee to re-elect the president through its subordinate financial committee. The candidates, Richard Nixon, George McGovern. But Nixon didn't think he was going to run against George McGovern. He thought it was Edmund Muskie and they were going to go after him. Oh, there he is on the campaign trail, uh, Richard Nixon. On uh, August 29th, uh, Richard Nixon, speaking at a news conference, stated, I can categorically deny that no one in the White House staff, no one in this administration presently employed, was involved in this very bizarre incident. Yeah, it was bizarre. Hmm. Call me Dick. And one day he said to him, oh, uh, Mr. Nixon or President Nixon, this is about 85, 86, uh, because I saw him. You see him all the time, Yankee Stadium. Um, Oh, 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 no. Oh, oh, call me Dick. Okay, Dick it is. I always call him Dick. Nothing to see here. August 30th, Nixon announces that John Dean has completed an internal investigation into the Watergate break-in. And guess what? There's no evidence of White House involvement. 
let's go on. Nothing to see. But these two guys are still digging up the dirt. Bernstein and Woodward. September 29th, Washington Post reports that Nixon's former Attorney General, John Mitchell, once controlled a secret fund to finance intelligence gathering against the Democrats. When Carl Bernstein calls Mitchell for a comment, Mitchell threatens both Bernstein and Catherine Graham, the publisher of the Post. The Post prints the threat. I gotta say something from the journalistic standpoint here. Two of the heroes of Watergate are Catherine Graham, the publisher, and Ben Bradley, the editor, who allowed this to go on. And there is Muskie. Muskie is the guy that they're most afraid of. October, Woodward and Bernstein report that the FBI made connections between Nixon and the aides and Watergate break-in. Uh, Woodward and Bernstein described the existence of a major dirty tricks campaign conducted against the Democratic presidential candidate Edmund Muskie, one orchestrated by uh, Donald Segretti and others, paid by a uh, creep in Nixon's private attorney. November 7th, Nixon is elected to a second term in office, easily defeating the Democratic candidate George McGovern. Uh, Nixon wins 49 of 50 states, gets 520 electoral votes, 61% of the popular vote, and he beats McGovern by nearly 18 million votes. But there are storm clouds, storm clouds brewing, and the White House knew there'd be trouble ahead in 1973. The Allies leave Vietnam, the Allies, including New Zealand and Thailand. Uh, they had a small military contingent, but they were part of the coalition. The United States continued to participate in combat, primarily with air power to assist the South Vietnamese army. Negotiators in Paris attempted to find a peace agreement, but war would drag on. As of January 1st, 1972, 113, 200 members of the military, men and women. A woman scolded me about four years ago when I'm doing a talk about Vietnam, talking about the boys, and she said, there were girls there too. I said, you know what, you're right. There were more than 500,000 uh, military people in Vietnam in 1968. And that's Hanoi Jane. Jane Fonda goes to North Vietnam. And 50 years later to this day, there are people who dislike her for this action. July, Jane Fonda accepted an invitation to visit North Vietnam. During her two-week stay, Fonda concluded that America was unjustly bombing farmland in areas far flung from military targets. She made several radio announcements over the voice of Vietnam radio to implore U.S. pilots stop the bombing. Fonda incurred the wrath of veterans and politicians. Okay, there I am. This is 20 years ago. There I am, and there is my friend Harvey. Now, uh, Harvey Schiller worked for George Steinbrenner with the Yankees, and he worked for Ted Turner, and he worked for Ted Turner, Turner Sports, and we used to get together down in Palm Springs and other places that, that I, covering stories, and Harvey and I became friends um, over the years. And uh, Harvey uh, was, uh, he is Lieutenant Colonel Harvey Schiller retired, uh, flew missions in Vietnam in 66 and 67. And uh, the boss's wife is Jane Fonda, and Harvey is going to all these functions with Ted. And Jane would see Ted, uh, see Harvey, and she'd run the other way. She'd run the other way. Uh, Ted was, um, Harvey was Ted's right hand man. Uh, officially, he's Lieutenant Colonel Harvey Schiller, retired. Um, and he keeps seeing. Uh, Jane, and Jane's running away. And he says to Jane one day, hey, Jane, listen, stop. Stop running away. Let's grow up. We're adults here. And he says, hey, look, um, I'm defending your rights. Took an oath. I'm defending your rights. I may or may not disagree with what you did in North Vietnam, but you know what? We're adults. I see you. You see me. Say hello. We don't have to talk. Don't run away from me. Uh, I told that story to a number of vets over the years, and they, they shake their heads saying that Harvey was a far better man than they were because they never forgave Jane Fonda. Peace talks break down. Uh, December 13th, that's when they break down, and uh, Nixon and the military decide a different approach. The new plan? Drop those things. December 18th, five days after a breakdown in the peace talks, Richard Nixon announces the start 
of Christmas bombing of North Vietnam. The American B-52 and fighter bombers dropped 20,000 tons of bombs in the cities of Hanoi and Haiphong. The United States lost 15 of the giant B-52s, 11 other aircrafts during the attack. North Vietnam claimed that 1,600 civilians were killed. The bombings end December 29th. North Vietnam goes back to the table, bargaining table in Paris. On uh, January 27th, 1973, Richard, Nick, excuse me, Richard Nixon signs the Paris Peace Accords, ending direct U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. The North Vietnamese accept a ceasefire. Terrorism comes into your living room uh, in September of 1972. Nine Israeli athletes, two coaches, are killed what is known as the Munich Massacre, the Massacre. And it's right there on ABC TV with Jim McKay telling you exactly what is going on as far as he can tell and his CBS colleagues, ABC, I'm sorry, ABC colleagues. The attack, the day of terror, begins at 4.30 a.m. September 5th, Munich, time uh, 10.30 back uh, in New York in the East Coast. Eight Palestinian militants affiliated with Black September, uh, a group that tried to assassinate Jordan's King Hussein twice in 1970 and fought a war in Jordan until the Jordanians kicked them out. He ended up uh, in Syria and ended up in Lebanon. This was uh, one of the groups fighting. It was an offshoot of the Palestinian group Fatah. Uh, they scale a fence around the Olympic Village in Munich and they're uh, disguised as athletes using stolen keys and they force their ways into the quarters of the Olympic team. 10 p.m. September 5th, the Germans, believing that uh, they had reached an agreement with the terrorists, the terrorists lead their bound and blindfolded hostages from their quarters into the buses and transported them to waiting helicopters. And there is Jim McManus, Jim McKay, the former news guy at the Baltimore Sun, who actually tried to host game shows uh, on TV in the 1950s. By 1230 on September 6th, the shooting had stopped. The 20-hour reign of terror was over. 11 Israelis had been killed. One Munich police officer also dead. Five uh, September, black September terrorists lay dead. Three of the gunmen captured. They're all gone. At uh, 3 a.m. local time, 9 o'clock New York time, McKay, who basically was doing kind of nothing when they said, just put on a jacket, don't worry about your pants. He was kind of swimming. Uh, get to get over to the broadcast center. They throw a coat on, put some makeup on, and he's on for 14 hours. Summarize the tragic outcome of the botched rescue with the words, they're all gone. German authorities never did storm Building 31. They allowed the terrorists to take the hostages by helicopter to a nearby military base. There, the Germans had planned an ambush and rescue operation. It was badly bungled. The nine, uh, nine of the Israeli hostages were killed by a combination of terrorist gunfire and a hand grenade that one of the Palestinians set off in a helicopter as it sat on the ground. Oh, he's upset. He is upset. Nixon, in a telegram sent to Avery Brundage, demanded that the rest of the games be called off, Brundage, the IOC. But here is Brundage. The games must go on. The games must go on. At the memorial service on September 6th, Brundage announced that the games would continue. The 1936 games, prior to the, the Munich games, uh, Brundage was interviewed. He said, 1936 games, finest ever, the Hitler games. Brundage would be a central character in German Olympics history. Uh, in 1999, I interviewed Mark Spitz. We're at the Helmsley Palace in New York. I don't know what the occasion was. I just know that he was there. And uh, I interviewed him. And what you're going to see now is the interview. Uh, well, what you're going to read now is the interview. Uh, Mark Spitz, the Jewish American swimmer, set a record of winning seven gold medals, was taken out of Munich to London because he was probably a high-value target of other terrorists. A news conference celebrating Spitz's achievements was hurriedly canceled. And here is Mark Spitz. Not me. This is Mark Spitz. Swimming program had stopped. Swam all my events in that evening. The last day of competition was on Monday. And this happened on Tuesday. On the morning, swimming was through, so I didn't have to compete anymore. Come on, come on, come on. 
Okay, wait, wait, what happened there? Oh, there we go. I had a press conference right afterwards on Tuesday, and that was when everyone told me about this Israeli tragedy or the thing that was happening at the time and turned into a major tragedy at the moment, at least at that time. They didn't know much about it. The next day, I was whisked away. At the tribute, Avery Brundage offered 27 world tribute to our Israeli friends. The games must go on. And Brundage, who was the International Olympic Committee, and the International Olympic Committee ordered the competition to resume after a pause of 34 hours. George Wallace is assassinated, in, not assassinated, he's shot in Maryland at a campaign rally. Uh, the Alabama governor, the segregationist, is shot three times on May 15th in an attempted assassination attempt by Arthur Bremer, and that left him paralyzed. Bremer was a 21-year-old busboy when he shot George Wallace, paralyzing the Alabama governor from the waist down. Bremer originally planned to shoot Richard Nixon in a bid to capture world attention, but he realized he couldn't get too close to the president, too well protected, so let's go after somebody else, Wallace was best known for his stance for being a segregationist. There was Bremer being arrested. Bremer had traveled to Maryland to a uh, Wallace campaign rally, and after the candidate had finished speaking, he made his way through the crowd, opened fire with his 38 revolver, striking Wallace in the abdomen. Wallace would recover, but he would be paralyzed. Uh, Wallace did win two Democratic primaries after being shot in Michigan and Maryland, but would drop out of the race by summer after being shot. Bremer was convicted on August 4th, 1972, sentenced to 63 years in prison. He served 35 years, was released in 2007 at the age of 57. The troubles continue in Northern Ireland. Uh, that starts uh, in 69, really 69 in earnest. And it's the Catholics against the Protestants. In August 1971, against the backdrop of escalating violence and increased bombings in Northern Ireland, Britain's new law, the Britain new law, was introduced, uh, giving authorities the power to imprison people without trial interment. Um, 13 people are killed, 15 are wounded after members of the Army's Parachute Regiment opened fire on civil rights demonstrators in the Bogside, a predominantly Catholic part of Londonderry. That was Sunday, June 30th, bloody Sunday. The British government decided the only way it could restore order in the then two-year battle between the Catholics and the local police in Londonderry. Uh, the British government in 2010 apologized for the unjustified and unjustifiable killings of 13 Catholic civil rights protesters by British soldiers and the 14th, who would die later of his wounds. In 2019, Northern Ireland's Public Prosecution Service said there was enough evidence to prosecute one paratrooper, known only as Soldier F, for the murders of James Ray and William McKin McKinney, but nothing ever came of it. Some of the things that uh, are still around today, store in 72, home box office. The oldest and longest continuously running cable TV service is 50 years old. Originally named the Green Channel, but became home box office to highlight their Hollywood and sports content. That would be New York Rangers, New York Knicks games, and Los Angeles Kings, Los Angeles Lakers games. The Godfather came out. Uh, the Godfather was a crime film directed by Francis Ford Coppola, who co-wrote the screenplay with Mario Puzo, based on Puzo's best-selling 1969 novel of the same name, and I bet you... Uh, you have them both uh, at the library. Check with Jennifer. Uh, Marlon Brando, Al Pacino, and James Caan were the stars. It is the first installment in the Godfather trilogy, the story spanning from 1945 to 55. Hey, the first video game. Yeah, video game's right there, right? First video game, Pong. Wasn't much to it. Atari released Pong. Pong was a table tennis theme arcade featuring two simple two-dimensional or featuring simple two-dimensional graphics. It's boring. But you know what was new? It was great. The last man on the moon was Gene Servant. Apollo 17 was launched on December 7th. Commander Eugene Cernan and lunar module pilot Dr. Harrison Schmidt walked on the moon while the command module pilot Ronald Evans orbited above. December 14th, just before going back into the lunar module, 
Surlin drove the lunar rover roughly a mile away so that video camera could be uh, could take photographs uh, or photograph the takeoff the next day. Uh, Surlin kneels down, etched his daughter's trace, uh, daughter Tracy's initials TDC into the dust. As far as anybody knows, the initials are still there. The 1972 legacy. Well, we got three senators there: Rob Portman, Ron Johnson, and Mitt Romney, and they're kind of worried about the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Three over 65-year-old Republicans, a party dedicated, hey, that's their goal. They've stated this, to turning back the clock on women's rights in the United States. Senators Rob Portman of Ohio, Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, and Mitt Romney of Utah sent a letter in February 2022 to the U.S. archivist David Ferrero asking for his commitment that he would not certify the ERA. 1972 legacy. Olympics, Winter Olympics, this February in Beijing. China, of course, became a major player on the world stage. Nixon would resign as president of the United States August 9th, 1974. He would be pardoned by his successor, Gerald Ford, for any Watergate crimes. Woodward and Bernstein, they're still around today. You still see them. Uh, they're the subject of the 1976 movie, All the President's Men played by Dustin Hoffman as Bernstein and uh, Robert Redford as Woodward. Uh, the United States would evacuate Vietnam in 1975. Oh, Bernice Garrett, she stayed in baseball. She ended up working uh, in a community job for the New York Mets. Jane Fonda has not been forgiven by a segment of the American population because of her actions in North Vietnam. A lot of people don't even know about it today. She was nicknamed Hanoi Jane but her acting career didn't suffer much. Germany has never hosted another Olympics. Israeli and the, Pal the Israelis and the Palestinians have never solved or resolved their differences. The uh, former majority leader of the United States Senate, George Mitchell of Maine, brokered a deal to resolve the differences in Northern Ireland in 1988. HBO is a multi-channel service. The Godfather, one of the most consequential movies in movie history. No man, no woman has ever returned to the moon and the video games evolved into a big business. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I'm done here, but um, they're not done out there. So uh, <laughs> whatever they want to ask, the floor is all theirs. Okay. Thank you so very much, Evan Wiener. That was ex so excellent. As usual, you're like this Fount of information, and and uh, I don't think sometimes you know, like when you, you do have a stopping point, which is good. Yeah. Otherwise, you could cut. So, as you said, you should have a part two on this. Yeah. Um, I am starting to unmute everybody. Okay. So, or you could use the chat, ask any questions or comments. Uh, um, you know, anybody any gets there about uh, Jane Fonda or. Anybody protest the war or anybody uh, supported the war? You know, there, there's a whole potpourri, which is no longer a category, uh, potpourri rather, no longer a category in Jeopardy, which really upsets me because I used to like potpourri. <laughs> and yes, we have those books, the Godfather books at the library. My mom is a huge Godfather fan. She would not forgive me if we didn't have them. How about the movie? Um, so. Does anyone have any questions or comments? You could either, I'm trying to you unmute can, or you can un unmute chat. yourself. Or unmute yourself. I heard someone start to speak. Hi, this is Lori. I just wanted to let you know that my um, my childhood home, we bought the um, home from our home from Mario Puzo oh, in Merrick, Long Island. Oh. He wrote, he actually wrote The Godfather in my house because we bought the house in like 19, around the year that he, he around 1968, 1969, I was like two, three years old. Yeah. Did wow. uh, your parents get an autographed copy of the book at least? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's actually an incredible, you know, you incredible, don't forget I know. like that. Now, where was this? Merrick, Long Island, New Merrick. York. 
Nice. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Yes, Catherine is saying thank you, friends, the library. I, I echo that, and I'm sure many of them you do. Um, you know, I have a, um, a question, Evan, as the, um, you know, a big fan of Title IX. I think, you know, uh, I was born in 1975, so by the time I got to third grade, it was great to participate participate in sports uh, to a level, but it was, it was funny, you know, we were, uh, I was in recreational softball and loved it, but we were, our team were undefeated champions for a while, but we weren't considered champions. Uh, we got not even a mention in the local paper while the local, you know, little league teams, the same, you know, age and, and group as us, you know, got their, their names in the front page of the of the local papers. And I think it's still taking a while for uh, women's sports to catch up, but at least, you know, uh, 1972 at least started the ball rolling. Now, uh, there, there my, this... my, my question was actually, yeah. Babe did Jerkinson, you know, consider, yes. you know, the greatest female athlete. What kind of, you know, influence did she have at all in, in uh, women's sports? Glad I know it's not related to 1972, but I'm thinking sort of that. Glad, that you, asked, that. glad you asked that because I do a talk called Women in Sports. And there are, there's the one side, she's a great athlete. And then there's the other side, the racist. And you might, uh, you might have the book in the library. I can't think of, I can't think of the name. But uh, Louise Stokes, uh, I think it's called Fast Girls. Um, in 1932, uh, going to the Olympics, and, and, and Babe, of course, was part of the Olympic team, uh, there was, uh, the team was going uh, on, on a train, and they get into Denver, uh, and then, uh, well, they get into Denver, but before they get into Denver, uh, Babe was not happy that uh, Tidy uh, Pickett, Pickett and uh, Louise Stokes Fast Girls, I think that's the name. You probably have, you might have it in, in the library. Two African-American um, uh, performers, first two African-American women ever to make a uh, track team. And uh, she's going through the train with ice water and she opens their door and the, one of them's on top, the other one's on the bottom. And whoever was on the bottom, she spills the ice water all over her. I think it was Pickett that she spilled the wa uh, water all over. And that set off a number of things that happened on the 1932 team. They separated uh, uh, Pickett and Stokes. They put them in a different part of the train. They were no longer uh, allowed to eat with the rest of the team. And uh, they get to Los Angeles and uh, the coach, uh, a guy by the name of uh, George uh, Vreeland, uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't even consider uh, having them race. Um, and uh, so the two of them just sat and watched. Um, Stokes would become the first African-American to participate me female in uh, 1936 in the Berlin Olympics. Uh, they both did, but um, Stokes went before Pickett. Uh, I think uh, one of them ended up becoming an educator in Chicago and has, I think it's Pickett, who has a school named after her. So um, yeah, she was a great athlete, but apparently not really a great human being. Doesn't sound like it. So it's an interesting story for anybody who wants to uh, know about the 1932 American. Also, one other thing, the, uh, I do, again, I do this women in sports thing, which I'm doing a lot this month. Um, the Olympic movement literally threw women out in 1914 they allowed them just to be in two sports fencing was one of them uh and uh, there was a woman by the name of alice melliot and alice melliot uh was uh, a rower she was on crew and she didn't take this lying down and she helped organize uh women's olympics for 1922 in paris and there were four women's olympics 22 in paris 26 in um, gothenburg sweden 30 in Prague and 34 in uh, London. And the New York Times in 1922 had a glowing review of the Women's Olympics saying that the women were much better than they thought. And then in 1924, 
Time Magazine put Edith Cummings on the cover. She won a uh, golf invitational. And uh, she was turned into a character named Jordan Baker in The Great Gatsby because she knew Gatsby. And, uh, and the other one is Gertrude uh, Etherly, who lived in Bergen County, who swam the English Channel in 1926. First woman to complete it, sixth person to complete it, five men, and she beat all of the men's times. Anybody else with any questions? Well, okay. Well, I wanna, well, I... Yeah, oh. let me thank everybody who's still in the room here. Um, we'll do that for taking their time. We got, um, hold on, I see we got Jim and Hartzell and Barber. Uh, I can't, it, this is not moving. Uh, Carol's iPad and Barber, and who else is there? And Hartzell, um, Jim Townsend and John's iPad and uh, it looks like uh, Landy uh, and Lori and uh, Marcy and uh, uh, Mary and uh, Mary and Merrill and uh, Tab and Brendan. Thank you all for uh, spending yes. a little time with me tonight. And and, and several of those are friends of the library. And precluding me from so babysitting. And precluding me from babysitting. <laughs> <laughs> and this um, program was recorded thanks to Evan, uh, Evan's um, permission. So we will, if you wanted to go through anything, we'll, you know, at one point we'll have it either on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, but we'll certainly promote it once we uh, end this program and, and um, make sure everything's there, but it will be, it is recorded so you can view it again. So thank you everybody. And again, shout out to Friends of the Library and then congratulations on 50 years of service to us in our community and have a great night, stay safe. Uh, you know, enjoy this, you know, spring weather is coming around the corner and hopefully we can all start to really um, embrace the, the, the weather and the, you know, good health again. So take care, everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for inviting me. We're getting snow here. I'm supposed to be in Connecticut tomorrow. <laughs> I know. But uh, we will see what we will see. Anyway, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you to the friends. Thank you for uh, being out there. My name is Evan Weiner. Hope to see you soon again. And thank you, Jennifer. Take care. Bye-bye.